The crisis in Syria explodes beyond its borders. Two bombs hit the Iranian embassy in the Lebanese capital, Beirut. A group linked to al-Qaeda claims to be behind the attacks carried out in a Hezbollah stronghold, casting a dark sectarian shadow. This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme with me, David Foster. A Lebanese-based group linked to al-Qaeda has claimed responsibility for what it described as a double suicide attack on the Iranian embassy in Beirut. It's the latest in a series of bomb attacks linked to the two-and-a-half-year-old conflict in neighbouring Syria. More than 20 people have been killed in the Beirut attack, which is more evidence, many say, of the regional dimension to the war in Syria and the sectarian edge to the conflict. Fighters from Lebanon have travelled across the border to fight on both sides of the Syrian divide and they've attacked each other on Lebanese soil as well. On the one side there is Hezbollah, an Iranian-backed Shia group based in southern Lebanon. It's the most powerful single party in the Lebanese parliament and its allegiance is to Syria's Bashar al-Assad. Then there are fighters from Lebanon's Sunni groups, which have been in the main fighting alongside rebels inside Syria. This latest attack has been claimed by a Lebanese-based group linked to al-Qaeda that's known as the Abdullah Azam Brigade, formed in 2009 as an offshoot of al-Qaeda in Iraq. Tehran, though, has accused Israel of being behind the bombings. To our guests in a moment, after we hear from Soraya Leni in Tehran and Zeyna Khoda in Beirut. The Iranian embassy targeted in the southern suburbs of Beirut. Observers believe it was a clear message to the Iranian government and the latest spillover of the Syrian war. Iran, we know, is a, uh, a supporter of the Syrian government. It has provided not only political support but logistics support. And uh, they believe that this, um, this attack really is in retaliation for Iran's political stance. Iran also has a very powerful ally in Lebanon. The Lebanese Shia armed group Hezbollah and they have come under attack over the past few months for their role and support um, uh, support to the Syrian government and their, their role in the fighting. Their men are actually fighting on the ground in Syria. But we managed to speak to Hezbollah officials here on the ground and they reiterated the position of the group and that is bomb attacks like this will not change their position. They will continue to fight in Syria because for them it is strategic. They believe what is happening in Syria is an international conspiracy um, against the so-called resistance front. Uh, people here are quite worried that we are going to see uh, similar attacks in the days and weeks ahead, especially since the Syrian government has made gains on the ground and the rebels are on the defensive. The reaction from Iran is one of anger but also one of resolve about these attacks in Beirut on the Iranian embassy. Iran's foreign ministry has condemned the attacks as inhumane. Iran's ambassador to Lebanon who escaped the attacks has blamed Israel. The foreign ministry also backs up that claim, blaming Israel and its proxies. There are also injuries uh, and deaths to be worried about, of course, local uh, Lebanese caught up in these attacks and also security at the Iranian embassy. The Iranians saying several security guards have been killed. Its cultural attaché also caught up in the explosions. He was outside the compound at the time. Iran says it's going to investigate. Its embassy is now in charge of investigating these attacks and just how anyone could get so close to the Iranian embassy and cause so much damage. Let us bring in our guests in Beirut, Joseph Kachichian, a scholar, author and commentator and journalist with Gulf News. From Tehran, Mohamed Morandi, a political analyst and professor at Tehran University. And also joining us from the Lebanese capital is Jamal Gosen, managing editor of Al Akba Online News. Very warm welcome to all three of you. Joseph Kachichin, if I could come to you first. At the beginning of the program, I say the crisis in Syria explodes beyond its borders. I is there any doubt that this is Syrian related? 
Uh, no doubt about the fact that Syria's conflict not only has spilled over into Lebanon today, but it has been going on for the past uh, several years. Uh, the most visible evidence of this, of course, is the fact that Lebanon now is hosting approximately 25 percent uh, of uh, all the refugees, that Syrian refugees, uh, that have left that country. We have nearly a million and a half Syrian refugees in the country. But increasingly, because of Hezbollah's involvement uh, in Syria, uh, we are seeing periodically these kinds of bombings attack, uh, attacks. And uh, it's a tit-for-tat situation. There is a bombing in the uh, Ruiz area or in the southern suburbs of uh, Beirut uh, a few months ago. Then this was retaliated in Tripoli, where uh, two mosques were, were hit. And now today we see another uh, bombing in front of the uh, Iranian embassy. So this is an ongoing process. The Syrian civil war has spilled over into Lebanon, and Lebanon is in it for the foreseeable future. And let's bring in Jamal Ghosn, because I want to ask you about a, a claim made by the Ira Iranian Foreign ministry, ministry, that this was an inhuman crime, a spiteful act done by Zionists and their mercenaries. Why would it suit the Iranian government to point the finger here at Israel, as it often does, rather than at a group which already says it was behind the attack? Well, the Iranians have made it clear that whoever is acting whoever is acting uh, on uh, this is uh, basically serving Israeli agenda. Uh, they did not uh, specify that, they did not say Israel, Israel executed this bombing, but they did say that whoever did it, and this is uh, the ambassador in Beirut who said that, that uh, uh, whoever is doing it is serving Israeli interests because they have uh, the most to gain from infighting in Lebanon and in Syria. And indeed, when it comes to um, an Iranian diplomat, being one of the victims in this, Mohammed Morandi, will that make any difference to the Iranian response? Well, it depends. I mean, if it comes out, if it's revealed that at the end of the day Saudi money was behind this attack, then I think there will be a significant change in the situation. Uh, the Iranians know that the Saudis are spending a lot of money uh, to intensify the civil war in Syria and also uh, creating tensions in Lebanon, but um, if there's a direct involvement, then I think we'll have a very different situation. Uh, there's a very, though, I'd like to add one point, and that is that uh, the one reason why, uh, in addition to the other reasons already stated, why the Iranians uh, identify Israel is that the Iranians don't want to make this sectarian. They want to believe that the Israelis were behind this, and they want people to believe that the Israelis were behind it. Uh, contrary to the Saudis, who are highly sectarian and highly they promote uh, through tens of TV channels religious and sectarian as well as racial hatred, the Iranian narrative uh, that you see in different Iranian media out outlets as well as th uh, through the official uh, statements by the government are uh, the exact opposite. They, are, they try to steer clear of any form of sectarianism. Uh, Joseph Kachichi, let, let me come to you for a little bit of uh, a look at... Um, the Abdullah Azam Brigade, because I was interested to, to read that uh, a person they call the Emir, Majid bin Muhammad al Majid, had said less than 18 months ago that the one tactic he did not want his people to employ were suicide bombings and explosions in areas where civilians might get hurt. So, so why would they now resort to this? Is, is the group divided or is this a, a new tactic because of the, the desperation of some people? Just because there is some kind of a declaration by alleged Azam brigade groups claiming responsibility for the bombings today doesn't mean that, in fact, the Azam brigade groups were behind this. At this point, we just really don't know who committed these these horrible, atrocious crimes where so many people were killed and maimed. Uh, I was on the scene just a few hours ago, and I've seen with my own eyes the devastation. It was really horrible. But just because there is a claim doesn't mean that, in fact, those were the individuals who did it. The Azam brigades, as you said uh, earlier, the Azam brigades are Syrian. Most of these individuals uh, were, were long-term residents of Syrian jails. Many of them were tortured, and many of them are fighting inside Syria. Now, to say that, in fact, they're responsible for this at this point is really 
uh, going into the unknown because any person could have made this telephone call and claimed responsibility for it. And, and indeed, it, it is the is chaos that, that the sometimes who ensues, uh, Joseph. It is the chaos that, that follows these attacks that actually is um, the principal target. Uh, for those people who've carried them out, rather than sort of being able to say, look, it was us, this is what we did, and this is the reason we did it. There is a reason uh, for the confusion. Well, no, I understand that. I understand that. But I, what I'm saying is that I think that it's very important to understand that the perpetrators of this crime are not in I isolated perpetrators. There is a unfortunately, there, this country is divided. Lebanon is divided between two very polarized sections of society, Hezbollah on the one hand, Sunni extremists on the other, and they're fighting it out. And of course, at this point, both sides want to see the end of the other. And of course, Lebanon will be the ultimate victim of this. But we don't know who the actors are, whether it is the pro-Iranians or the pro-Saudis or the pro-Israelis. My God, there are so many actors that could have possibly tried to perpetrate this that one loses the imagination to find out who actually did it. Okay. So I, th I think we have to be careful at this point. Let's go to Mohammed Brandi in Tehran. Uh, just for a general question, r rather than specifically about this attack or, or these two bomb attacks, um, give us an idea why Iran thinks it is so important to support Hezbollah in Lebanon. Well, first of all, one thing that I'd like to make uh, clear is that, you know, and as you've pointed out, the, the vast majority of the people here were civilians that were killed. And in the media, we hear repeatedly Hezbollah stronghold, whereas, uh, you know, this sort of legitimizes the terrorist attack, this sort of, this sort of language. It's, it's not a Hezbollah stronghold. It's a civilian area, and mostly, and mostly civilians well, and were the, killed. And indeed, there are the many Iranian supporters support of Hezbollah, Hezbollah who, are, who have nothing to do with the military because it has a military wing and a political wing. Absolutely. Yeah, I just, just give us an idea That's why right. Iran feels it needs to support Hezbollah so strongly. Um, in another country? Well, Iran supports Hezbollah basically because Hezbollah was resisting the Israeli occupation in Lebanon. And uh, has, uh, Iran continues to support Hezbollah because there is an Israeli threat and there is no credible uh, support uh, coming from the Lebanese army because uh, the Lebanese army is not allowed to arm itself in a way which would be able to defend southern Lebanon in a significant way. Uh, so but the Iran Lebanese army has Hezbollah in the last six the months, of, sorry to interrupt you, just, just throw this point in, the Lebanese army has in the last six months at, at least uh, diffused, um, and this has been confirmed by, by Hezbollah, probably five or six devices, including a very large car bomb in the southern suburbs uh, of Beirut. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm talking about uh, Israeli aggression against Lebanon and the fact that the Israelis repeatedly uh, invade or attack neighboring territories, Gaza and southern Lebanon, as we've seen in recent years, uh, makes it a continued threat. Iran also supports Palestinian groups for the same reason in Gaza. Uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad are supported by Iran because of uh, the continued uh, aggression by the Israeli regime. This is not a, a new policy. And Iran's support for the Syrian government is basically in, op in opposition to extremism. The Iranians from the very start, from the very beginning of this outbreak, said that Syria needs reforms, there must be free and fair elections. The Iranians supported the Anand plan very early on. Yet it was the Americans and their allies who wrecked the plan. And at, even now, the Iranians are saying that we should, uh, Syria should have free and fair elections with international monitors, not necessarily Western modern monitors, but real international monitors. And uh, the results would be acceptable, completely acceptable to Iran. Okay, but it, the Iranian let me go to Jamal. fear let me go to Jamal from the Gosen, very start Gosen was here. terrorism and extremism. Yeah, I'll come back to you, Mohammed Mirandi, in just a moment. I promise that. But uh, Jamal Gosen, if, as Mohammed Mirandi is saying, then Iran supports free and fair elections in Syria, uh, why is its proxy Hezbollah so happy to see an estimate of between three and 10,000 fighters uh, going to support Bashar al-Assad? That doesn't um, seem to, to sit very much alongside free and fair elections. Well, I mean, uh, these are two separate things. Hezbollah, since the very beginning of the Syrian crisis, has insisted that the only solution in uh, Syria would be for the different factions to sit on the table and resolve it politically. 
what has evolved over the past two and a half years have led to a situation where there is a bit of uh, uh, military chaos uh, in different parts of uh, Syria, including the very strategic uh, border region between Lebanon and Syria. And that's where most of the involvement of Hezbollah uh, which, uh, has been. And uh, it's mainly its strategic depth that it's protecting. But if Hezbollah's raison d'etre is to protect Lebanon against an Israeli threat from the south, why are as many as 10,000 Hezbollah fighters in Syria? Well, we don't know how accurate this number is, but there have been, I mean, they are involved in, uh, in securing some towns along the border town. Uh, you, you mentioned how uh, earlier that Hezbollah is uh, uh, located in south of Lebanon. That's not exactly accurate. Hezbollah has a presence in, uh, throughout Lebanon and mostly in the Bekaa Valley, where a lot of its uh, military installations are, and uh, near the Syrian border. And, as, and they also have supply routes of uh, arms that come through them through Syria and through that area. So any uh, threat to that uh, route and any threat to its strategic depth over there would definitely hurt its capacity to defend against Israeli uh, aggression and uh, to uh, try to uh, sustain any or defend against any future uh, war like we had in 2006 uh, against uh, Lebanon by the Israelis. Can I just try and broaden this out just a little bit? Um, first of all, with you, Jay. Joseph Kachichian. Um, every time that I have been to Lebanon at times of crisis, everybody has said that the ripples that are uh, emanating from Beirut or other places in that country are felt uh, regionally and internationally uh, as well. Give our viewers a sense of why that is the case. It is the case because Syria was an occupying country of Lebanon for 30 plus years and that uh, they were forced to withdraw in 2005. And let us not forget that the official policy of the government of Lebanon, believe it or not, there is still a government of this country and Hezbollah is in it. And Hezbollah in June 2012 agreed to the official policy of this government, which is to disassociate itself with the civil war that's going on inside Syria. However, because Hezbollah operates under direct Iranian authority, obviously it is pursuing a totally different agenda, which means that is the reason why you have 10,000 uh, Hezbollah fighters inside Syria. Many of these young men are dying for causes that have nothing to do with Lebanon. And I think if you were to take a public opinion poll in this country, you will find that you don't have a 50-50 split you have the majority of the people of this country who are asking fundamental questions about what is it that Hezbollah is defending in Syria that is in the interests of Lebanon. So far, I think very few people have come up with a logical answer. There are very emotional ties that obviously link Hezbollah with their brethren inside Syria and Iran. But obviously, those are different from the official policy of the government, again, I repeat, in which Hezbollah is a full and legitimate member and has agreed to the disassociation policy. Mohammed Morandi, let me come to you and, and sort of turn the, the original question round on itself. Um, a stable Lebanon uh, means what to Iran rather than an unstable one? Well, a stable Lebanon is very important to Iran, and, uh, but I would also add that um, uh, recent polls, the most recent polls that were taken in Lebanon and, and the most recent elections actually showed that the alliance that Hezbollah is a part of has the majority of the votes in Lebanon. Uh, so um, they had, they, in the last election, they got 55 percent of the votes, but because of the system there, they, they got a minority of seats. But um, uh, and also, I would like to add that Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, I, I believe very confidently that he has more influence over Iran than Iran has influence there. He's a very influential figure, and he's by no means a proxy. Uh, but I would add that the main fear of Iran is sectarianism, and this is something that's being promoted by more than tens of channels funded by dictatorships in this region. Uh, extremist organizations go out on a daily basis uh, funded by extremist uh, clerics and supported by extremist governments and they say they call for the death of 
people from different minorities, whether they're Shia, whether they're Alawite, whether they're Christian. You have the fatwas on television. They say, kill the men, take the women. I have quite a few of these on my own cell phone. Uh, this is the fear that the Iranians have more than anything else. And unfortunately, uh, Western countries have closed their eyes to the sort of extremism that the Saudis have been exporting for over three decades. Al-Qaeda is ideologically, uh, politically very separate from Saudi Arabia, but ideologically very similar. Uh, in the past, the tragedy of Afghanistan, which had repercussions across the globe, uh, was uh, created great devastation in this region because of the invasion of Afghanistan later on, 9-11, then the invasion of Iraq. And now we have a much more dangerous al-Qaeda that has been created, al-Qaeda affiliates close to the Mediterranean, and a much more dangerous situation that we had uh, 10, 15 years ago. This so, is so, a great so, I'm sorry, we, we, I'm going so to have to move this across to... Um, Joseph Kachichian, sure. uh, Professor Morandi, apologies for interrupting, but we're coming to the business end of the program. Uh, we've only got a couple more minutes left. Joseph Kachichian, when, when former Lebanese Prime Minister Saad Hariri says it, it's up to all parties to um, sort out these difficult times and to, to stop military intervention in Syria, he's not just talking about Hezbollah, he's not just talking about the Shia here, he's talking about his own people, the Sunnis, uh, and to a lesser extent the Christians. Look, Lebanon is a cosmopolitan society. It is composed of all its populations, Muslim and Christian, Sunni, Shia, Maronite, Greeks, Armenians, the lot, if you would like. Anyone who assumes for a moment that any one of these communities can dominate the others has really not learned the lessons of the civil war that, were, that went on between 1975 and 1990. I think the Lebanese need to resolve their own problems internally. They do not need to be associated with the civil war in Syria. And more importantly, they do not need any foreign powers, no matter where they come but, from, but, but, but from let, the moon, from Iran, from Saudi Arabia. How can they possibly Arabia. be expected to sort out their own problems when they can't even sort out their own government? Well, that's the, that, that's the dilemma. The reason why they cannot sort out their, their government because there is no unity at home. And on Friday, Lebanon will celebrate its 70th independence. And one really has to ask itself, what do the Lebanese want in this independence? Do they really want to be independent? And that means independent from everyone else. But we also know that the Saudis okay, do not get... want the government right now in Lebanon to be formed. I'm sorry, Mohammed, we didn't hear that. I, just, I was just saying that we all know, though, that right now the Saudis are preventing uh, Lebanon from being formed uh, and uh, to create stability. The Saudis are really pushing very hard on all fronts. In the case of Syria, th the solution is quite clear. They went for a military solution for over two and a half years. They've devastated the country. They've created civil war. They've pursued sectarian and racist and religious hostility. And to the, you know, to, and it has hurt everyone and has destroyed uh, many communities. The only way forward right now is, to, is for Western countries to set aside their alliance with these extremists, extremist regimes, and for the people of Syria to sit side by side and find a resolution to this problem. Jamal, and the fear of Christians and, and Muslims in Lebanon is justified because of the existence of extremists in Syria. Jamal Gosen, uh, final word from you. Uh, we heard from Joseph Kikichian that the anniversary of independence, the 70th anniversary of independence is approaching rapidly. Um, is Lebanon in any way independent? Uh, well, this was a uh, 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 made up independence 70 years ago and the uh, 70 years that Lebanon has lived since then has have been formative and there the country might be uh, independent at some point in the future and it might be under different borders but the reality of the matter is that Lebanon uh, as an entity has been a failed state since its inception well on that uh, extremely pessimistic note um, I have to say thank you thank you to all of my guests uh, that is Joseph Kachichian Mohamed Mirandi and Jamal Gosen, uh, thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. And a reminder to you who are watching, you can find this edition and many more at facebook.com slash AJ Inside Story and can leave your comments for us there too. We do read them. <laughs> Lebanon, once again, and the oft-repeated scenes of twisted wreckage, the possibility of political turmoil once again. Beirut, November 2013, but for a country that has seen this 
so often it could have been any time in recent decades. From me, David Foster, and the Inside Story team, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.